Today on the show, we're going to take a look at movie franchises that had their stories retconned. Franchises don't always go perfectly planned. Sometimes you have a really good start, but along the way the sequels really ruin any sort of improvement for the franchise. What do we do in this scenario? Ignore certain movies! From big budget to low budget, film franchises get retconned all the time. Sometimes it's as little as a line of dialogue that is added to ensure the heroes don't defeat their enemies the same way. Or as massive as ignoring almost the entirety of the franchise itself. Today, we're going to take a look at some films that try to save a failing franchise with a clever retcon, some films that actually pulled off a retcon and won back fans, and some franchises we think could be solved with a retcon. And by the way, you can now find this podcast on Spotify. So give us a listen and a follow. Welcome back to the Behind the Screen Podcast. I'm joined today by my good bud, Nicholas, again. How are you, bud? Hey, Gorian. I'm good. How are you doing? Dude, I'm doing really good. Good. Great. I wish I could retcon this conversation because today <laughs> we're taking a look at film franchises that have changed their retroactive continuity. And that's basically a big fancy way of saying that a film introduces new information that makes you interpret its previous events differently. Also on the show, I'll be talking with Rob Keyes, the editorial and executive director of Screen Rant. Him and I talked a lot about good and bad retcons in the Star Wars franchise and whether or not creators should stick by their original ideas or do they have absolute freedom with their own properties. So what better way to explain it than a few quickfire examples? Yeah, man, let's do it. I'm excited. Creed had a retcon where Apollo Creed had an affair with someone during Rocky IV just before he got in the ring and died fighting Ivan Drago. Whoa. Brian Singer's Superman Returns ignores the third and fourth films as well as Supergirl and picks up right after the second film. Love it. The entire Saw franchise is like one non-stop <laughs> retcon where people are constantly coming and going and working secretly for each other. <laughs> the Fast and Furious films have been retconned, dead people back to life, bad guys turning good. In Iron Man 2, apparently one of the small kids that Iron Man saved was Peter Parker, they decided. Really? After the fact? I mean, yeah. I, I imagine it would be. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, this makes sense. Maybe. Possibly. We totally meant that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, all of the Terminator franchise is one complicated retcon. Interesting. You know, these are all really good examples, but I'm going to tell you right now, Gorian, the biggest takeaway for me at this moment is the fact that it's actually retcon and not redcon. And now I feel like an idiot. <laughs> so th- thank you for teaching me something new today. For all intensive purposes, it's going to be retcon today. Yeah, it's all water under the fridge, my friend. I find retcons are like garnishes on your meal. You almost never ask for them, but when they're presented nicely, they kind of add to the overall meal. But you would never just throw a handful of uncut parsley on some pasta and call it a day. Some retcons stick out like a sore thumb. Even worse, they can be so bad that it's hard to forget them while you're watching the movie they tried to retcon. We're going to take a look at some movie retcons that add nothing and worse might potentially take away from the franchise. Spider-Man 3. Uh. When Spider-Man 3 came out, (laughs) people knew that there was something strange going on with the film already. We heard a lot about the behind the scenes going on and how there was constantly different villains being changed. And we were hopeful. And when the film finally came out, it left a lot of people scratching their heads over a lot of the choices that went into the movie. But I think one of the ones that left everyone really puzzled was, why do they make Sandman Uncle Ben's killer? No idea. (laughs) Are you serious? Through flashbacks, it shows that Uncle Ben was shot by Sandman during the course of the first film. And it was clearly done so that Sandman would be the sympathetic villain. But he was already robbing people to provide medicine for his daughter. This is a great example of having a retcon that doesn't ruin the film in any way, but I can't watch that first Spider-Man again without thinking, well, technically, that's Sandman killing Uncle Ben right there, and he's going to turn into sand and go into the sewer and slither away. You know, it's these things you don't forget when you're watching these movies. But honestly, I think one of the reasons this happened was because Sam Raimi uh, was having a lot of issues with Sony at the time, because Sony wanted to go in one direction, Sam Raimi wanted to go in another. I think it could have been good if Sam had... All the creative control. Maybe. And maybe if you had like a fourth film and they could tie it up nicely. It kind of just felt like they were trying to like shove everything every which way. And Ugh. 
again, having Uncle Ben's killer be this like faceless person adds to the Spider-Man persona to me, where he yeah. just wants to protect the common person from the usual bad guys of New York City. Yeah. You know, the whole thing is that Spider-Man, he's not always stopping villains. He's stopping purse snatchers and people stealing bikes, you know? Yeah. And I think having Uncle Ben's killer kind of be just another one of those like people that you'll never know adds to the persona versus giving him a direct villain, you know? Yeah. So moving on from this, we have a franchise that you're very knowledge on, and <laughs> I'd love to hear more about this from you. And it's Spectre. And I love Casino Royale. Uh, I kind of got bored in the middle of Quantum of Solace, and I haven't seen any of the other films. But that being said, hearing that the retcon happened in Spectre makes me really upset. And I'm not even interested in the franchise. So can you tell me what the retcon in Spectre was? Uh, yeah. You know what? Okay, listen, I'm going to start off by saying this. Don't get me wrong. I love Bond movies, and I, I do love the new ones, but the whole new franchise feels like a retcon to me. But um, essentially, Inspector, it turns out that Blofeld was behind everything. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, like, like everything, everything, like everything, 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 everything. everything. like everything. from the first movie, all the Bond girls dying. He was behind everything. Yeah, which seemed a little bit like uh, I'd say it was a bit of a cop out for me. I don't know. I think it could have been handled way better. I think it's one of those situations where we never want to hear. So many times in cinema now, you have the villain getting caught and that's being part of the plan or like them being foiled is always part of the plan. So to hear that Inspector, it was part of the plan for James Bond to catch the people in Quantum of Solace and to catch right. the people in, you know, Casino Royale right. and in the other ones, you know, and like, oh no, that was all part of a plan and there's no conceivable way James Bond could have won at the end of the day. There was always going to be this big reveal. Yeah. And that kind of bums me out, you know, it's so, especially with, isn't he supposed to be like a great big villain in the Bond universe, Blofeld? Exactly. He's supposed to be this, like the, the overseer, the one who calls all the shots, right? But it's like, I would rather go on with the Bond movies knowing that there's some mysterious being working behind the scenes in control of everything rather than like, dealing with it directly and seeing him up front, especially so soon. I wanted more buildup. Have you seen Hobbs and Shaw? I loved it. I did, yeah. The end of that movie is exactly like the end of a James Bond movie with the big oh. computers and everyone tapping away and you don't know who the secret voice is and you're yeah. like, well, what, what am I watching? A James Bond movie now or a Fast and Furious <laughs> movie? Honestly, it, it all blends together nowadays. Moving on, we have probably one of the more egregious ones for me and that's Alien 3 or Aliens 3. I'm not really sure the naming schematics for this one, but Alien is a great movie. Aliens is a great movie, but Aliens 3 is a misstep. And if you don't remember the end of Aliens, let me remind you. Uh -huh. Basically, the crew battles Aliens, Ripley kicks butt, and everyone goes to hypersleep at the end of the film. So <laughs> then we see this facehugger scuttle by really quickly, basically showing that the entire plot of the Aliens movie was meaningless. That's how the second movie ends. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's how the third movie starts. <laughs> it basically undoes everything the films have done. And I know the yeah. I know the Alien vs. Predator franchise loves putting a mystery egg at the end of its movies. What easier way is it to end a, an Aliens movie than just having a facehugger, you know? It's yeah. such a simple and annoying thing to do. And to have a film start with that and basically negate everything that happened before it. And I think that it was also a double blow because the first one, Ridley Scott, fantastic movie. The second one, James Cameron, fantastic okay. movie. David Fincher doing the third one. It really felt weird to have him kind of undo what these other two filmmakers did. Yeah. Basically, the third film starts with Newton Hicks, two fan favorites from the previous film. Right. And they're dead after being chestburstered. And this is one of those retcons where it's hard not to think about this when you're watching the previous movies. I mean, uh -huh. I'll know nothing will ever ruin the original films, but again, thinking that Uncle Ben you know, was killed by Sandman. Having Aliens 3 make the events of the entire last movie moot is like having Jaws 2 opening up with Richard Dreyfuss and Roy Schneider being killed off screen by the shark and having the police chief find their bodies. Right. It doesn't add anything to it, and it kind of just undoes everything you worked so hard to build towards. Yeah, exactly. And I will say this. David Fincher has come out and said that as a director, the reason why you should always push to have your vision seen through versus like the studios is because apparently what happened with Aliens 3 is that the studio had more control. Essentially, David Fincher got the blame for it because it was a bad movie in the end. Hey, buddy. Oh. Hey. Rob, you're the editorial director and PR king of Screen Rant, but you also do a ton of stuff behind the scenes. And I have no doubt that just means you've seen 
almost every film ever made. So we're going to try and squeeze out your film knowledge for today's episode about retcons in film. What do you think is a franchise that retconned something that just added nothing to it? What happens, and especially with Aliens 3, that movie widely changed from its original vision. But, but a lot of these franchises are picked up by different creators. And so like they are not... They don't feel the onus to like respect what came before. They just want to tell their own story within that universe. So that's when you get a lot of these continuity issues with any sort of ongoing franchise where it's not a single person, single vision. It's like random, you know, different people come in at different steps and they change it for different reasons. And like you said, fan feedback and studio feedback factors in and interferes with the vision. So I don't know if this is correct, but it was one of those one of the first movies to have a theatrical cut and like a director's cut oh. and kind of have the people splitting their heads between the theatrical yeah. version and like the David Fincher version. Yeah. And we do find a lot of these kind of more grandiose, complicated franchise movies will have a bunch of different cuts. I mean, you can't even have the first Blade Runner movie without like three different cuts for it. True, right? And speaking of cuts and recuts for movies, we move on to one of my favorite franchises of all time, and it's Halloween. Ah, yes. Horror movies are a shoe in for retcons because people love having the good guy win, but they also like seeing people killed by the main bad guy. You want to see Michael Myers get what's coming to him at the end of each Halloween movie, but you also want him to come back for the next one. So with horror movies, we're a bit more relaxed with how you bring back the bad guys. But sometimes it's, it's just too much to ignore. And the <laughs> films have been retconned three times. The Halloween franchise has had three resets, basically. And yeah. that's just a complete retcon. So Laurie Strode has been killed three different times over the franchise. And she was the main person in the first film, played by Jamie Lee Curtis. And... You know, we might get to see her die a fourth time in the sequel to the Halloween 2018 movie, Halloween Ends. Halloween 2 picks up right where the first film left off. A direct sequel takes place right after, and how could you screw up a direct sequel? Well, they made Lori Michael's sister, which is <laughs> such a lame thing to do, you know? It, it kind of felt like they were taking a page out of Star Wars by having them... Oh, actually, I am your brother, you know? Whoa. It kind of feels cheap. Yeah. And John Carpenter always regretted doing this, since it's a pretty basic attempt of a unique twist. In Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers, it's shown that Michael turned evil because of a weird cult. And this sixth Halloween movie is just a cluster. Paul mm -hmm. Rudd is in it, and they had screen tests for the film, which were apparently, quote-unquote, primarily 14-year-old boys. Huh. They disliked the ending with the weird cult stuff, and they reworked into what it is now, which is basically like Paul Rudd beating Michael Myers to death. And they reshot <laughs> the last third and used a slimmer Michael Myers. Interesting. Which led to this weird continuity error where he's suddenly, like, thinner for the last third of the movie. You're right. They should have just, like, retconned him drinking a Slim Fast down an alley or something, like, towards the end of the movie. They should have just retconned the existence of the movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Produce I mean, they did. Producer's cut came out, and we had the original <laughs> ending. And they have these two cuts out now where yeah. basically both are terrible movies. They realize this and they try to retcon it again. So we have Halloween, I don't know how you want to say this, H2O, H20, 20 years after the first Halloween movie came out. <laughs> Weird title I, right off the bat. It, it's no worse than Fast and the Furious and Fast <laughs> and Furious, Too Fast, Too Furious. Halloween, H2O, retcon films four to six, yeah. which is interesting because three was an anthology movie, but they still have it technically part of the canon. Yeah. And they reverse Laurie's first death and replace her daughter with a son. So already, if you've been watching these movies for a few years, you're kind of relearning the canon. And like, yeah. could you imagine one of the theaters and seeing Halloween 7 and it's just a completely different plot from the last movie? Yeah. There wasn't really enough internet and stuff back then to like go and complain about the stuff or like learn what a retcon is. Yeah. You just kind of put it out there and dealt with it. Yeah, exactly. The film finishes the franchise with Laurie chopping off Michael's head with an axe, yeah. which... I feel like there's no way he can come back from this, right? Mm -hmm. Chopped off head, pretty sure. But in Halloween Resurrection, which is notorious for Buster Rhymes kicking Michael through a window while saying, trick or treat, mother... <laughs> <laughs> The film starts with revealing that Michael switched places with the paramedic uh -huh. that was driving the ambulance, crushed his larynx so that Lori wouldn't hear him, and she basically killed an innocent person, and that drove her crazy. Huh. Not even could they retcon the previous films in H2O to give a satisfying ending, but then they had to retcon the retconned ending. It's right. just a snake eating its tail of a nonstop ending of retcons. Interesting. You know what? Honestly, Gorian, I have a question for you. 
and for our audience members listening in right now, but how many times do you think they can retcon a series before the series needs to die? That's a great question. Uh, thank you. It's also interesting, too, because we do have franchises like the nine Star Wars films, which are you know seen as three separate parts. And do you count those as like retcons near and there? Uh, I mean, there's also so many unknown uh, franchises. Like, I think there's like nine Hellraiser movies. You uh-huh. know, do people really <laughs> care about the Hellraiser retcons? That's no, true. they probably go out and like seeing the movies, you know? Right, right, right. With these bigger films, they, they can't afford to do retcons because they will lose interest and they'll see how muddy it is versus these smaller more independent films i think you're allowed to make mistakes and say hey we kind of meant it this way and kind of adjust it along the way versus if you're making 200 million dollars i really hope you don't go back on anything that you did right yeah what do you think uh you know what it's hard to say i think that once the money stops coming in uh that's a big yeah. deciding factor in where the series goes whether uh or, or whether or not it just stops I think it is possible to retcon one too many times. When you think of a retcon as something that changed something for the worse or added nothing, the easiest example is looking at Star Wars, going back to the original Star Wars, where Han Solo shot first. He did, uh, <laughs> and the whole character arc was built on that. Uh, He's it, a scoundrel! It, 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 you know, yeah. they changed it because I think they didn't want kids to think he was a bad guy, but like... We knew he was a bad guy. Like, he's a scoundrel. Except not only that, but he hangs out in a hive of scum and villainy, <laughs> to be quoted. But but it's, it's fundamental to the character. He is a scoundrel. He did smuggle. He dealt with bounty hunters who were after his head. That scene in the planet of Tatooine where it takes place is very built upon, you know, Western tropes. And that whole sequence plays out like what you see in a traditional Western film. And the original script you know, dated back to, I think it was March 15, 1976, a year before the film came out, confirmed that Greedo never even shot in the original script. It was all Han Solo. But the bigger point is the character arc was built upon that and he evolved from that to the hero we know him as and was always that for 20 years until they did the special editions. And by fundamentally changing the character, they did exactly what you you and I were saying. They they made it worse and, and they kind of ruined the whole point of that character being someone who was a scoundrel and became a general for the rebellion. The, the weird one is the midichlorians, because that's another example of something that didn't add anything to the franchise. It made it confusing and it kind of dampened the meaning of what the force really was. Take that for what you will. They, they definitely made changes with the, you know, the two examples we just cited. And you're right, in, in The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker, both played fast and loose with not just continuity but the consistency of the rules of star wars uh so it's 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 messy and again following this example you can't have it both ways so the the han solo shot first example in the script in the movie in the character's arc and for the 20 years afterwards we can't pretend it didn't happen for 20 years that's an example of a retcon that the rare example that it doesn't need to be considered canon because there are quite literally two canons to choose from now there is what we saw in the movie and what we saw in another version of the movie so now we have this is the option we have now to, to where we can step in and define what we think is canon because the good canon the original film is is what it should be because everyone hates the special edition including everyone who works at disney and lucasfilm now so that's an example where i guess there are two canons we can uh, make our own decision on which one we think is the quote-unquote real one. Retcons don't always have to be a bad thing. Sometimes they're necessary to take a new story in a new direction. Sometimes filmmakers use them to cover up mistakes of other films in the franchise. We're going to take a look at some films that got it right. The retcon not only serves an interesting purpose, but adds to the overall franchise as well. Speaking of Halloween, we have Halloween 2018. Oh boy. And Halloween tried to reboot itself again once with Rob Zombie, and that movie was... Different enough that it was its own thing. I appreciate how different it was, but it wasn't what a Halloween movie was. Right. Despite having a sequel, there were they weren't seen as true successors to the Halloween franchise. And in 2018, our prayers were answered with a brand new Halloween film that was gory it was r-rated it had great cinematography it had some bad acting it had some hilarious acting boogeyman's in this house okay all right come on i got you let's check it out Sit down first. <laughs> and it retconned all the films except for the very first one right i love it so finally after god knows how many films someone finally got it right and halloween 2018 was really good and i'm excited to see what direction the franchise can go in next i think they have either one or two more sequels planned for this. And I think a proper retcon should make you go back and watch the original source, not to fact check it, but because the original property holds up so well. 
you can consider Halloween 2018 a reboot in the sense that it's kind of a similar story and it's so far apart that, again, it is really hard to make a direct sequel to something 30 years later right. with how much technology changes and film changes. It's really hard to put them side by side and say this one is a true successor to this one. But when these reboots and retconned franchises get it so well done and they make you go back and watch that original movie just because you're so excited, yeah, I think that's a great retcon. You know what? That's a very good point. Because you watch Halloween 2018 and you'd much rather watch the first Halloween movie than Halloween H2O. I mean, it's yeah. great for newcomers too because it exposes them to a film that not only helps further how good Halloween 2018 is, but how good the original movie is. I mean, I don't think I'd ever want to watch Aliens again knowing that they all die at the end, you know? And speaking of films that came out far enough away that they could be considered reboots, we have Mad Max Fury Road. Ah, uh, yes. And Mad Max is a great example of retconning a film in the events of a franchise. And instead of making a sequel that directly ignores them, George Miller created a Mad Max film that just, it just doesn't really involve itself with any of the plot of like the weird third Thunderdome film. Mm -hmm. It feels like a direct sequel to the first two films. But again, there weren't really any concrete parallels between the two. It still took place in the same universe, but the filming style, everything is so radically different than that first film that it could be considered as a retcon slash reboot. We really got to think of a, a new word for these retcon reboots where they still talk about the first movies kind of, yeah. but also set their own things apart, you know? Okay, okay. Wait, what about rather than retcon, ret pro? Oh. Uh, uh, Webster's Dictionary, I'm here. Contact my agent. <laughs> I just... <laughs> strolled around my apartment in a circle because I think it's a great re, 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 what is it called? Repro? Repro? Repro. Repro. Yeah, I'll I take, love it. These are repros. It's a repro. I'll take my million dollars, please. <laughs> the best example, and it's another franchise that's still going strong, is Fast and Furious, right? That oh, that yeah. that was started out as sort of a fun summer film. They had a sequel where the actors didn't want to come back. They did a spin-off which made less money, but people liked it, and they found a way to bring back the cast. Still mess it up, but bring the pat bring the cast back again for Fast Five and make like the best movie in the franchise. And it went from you know it went from a second tier B movie franchise to like worldwide blockbuster, and it's just been growing ever since. And again, the continuity makes absolutely no sense. It went from criminal stealing VCRs to superheroes driving military vehicles and saving the world. And and you know characters like. Michelle Rodriguez played Letty, died and came back, memory loss. Another character died and is coming back in F9 next year. It's and characters who are now leads, like you look at The Rock playing Hobbs or or uh, the Deckard Shaw character, they, they were introduced as sort of like a company man for the military and a villain. And now they're both anti-heroes that got their own spin-off movie. And if you look at their character archetypes now, they are entirely different than who they were when they were first introduced to the IP. And nobody cares because it, it's just like, whatever, it's, it's it fun. It's a billion dollars. It's so much fun. Goes, you know, there's really no rules and expectations for that franchise, which is why I think those retcons absolutely work with it. Go crazy, <laughs> you know, just do anything you want because I know those films are going to be satisfying. And, and not only that, right? You take the Shaw character and they turn that into a family of Shaw characters <laughs> who, are, who are not just bad guys, but they're like ex MI5 like military British agents. And then same thing for, you know, the, the Shaw family. And going forward, Toretto now has a brother played by John Cena. So like nothing yeah. makes sense, but it's all like this franchise more than any other is like really for the fans. It's pure popcorn fan service yeah. and they can get away with it and people love it and cheer it on. And we, like I said, Han is coming back and that's yeah. because of the justice for Han movement. So it's literally only happening because fans demanded it. Tokyo Drift, I saw that movie 10 years ago and in the newest film, they had a flashback to that and they brought the guy who was already like 30 playing a high schooler and in the flashback <laughs> he's like 45 now playing the high schooler still and i yeah. i like how confident they are they they kind of just are like yeah we do what we want you know it's like let's have the cameo he won't join the team but we'll still show him I mean, again it's when you watch these movies we're family we're, we're the fast and furious family when we watch these movies so the next rep bro we have is <laughs> bumblebee and when you first take a look at bumblebee kind of like glaze over and you're like uh-huh uh-huh transformers movie and you kind of just hear that metallic screeching and transforming sounds yeah. in your head but this was directed by travis knight and he worked on all of the like a stop motion films over the years it was actually really weird when they announced this because i'm like the guy that did kubo and box trolls is making a freaking transformers movie yeah we already knew that this movie was going to be a bit different and a bit special compared to the michael bay live action ones 
And at first glance, the film kind of looks like a prequel. It takes place in the late 80s. Megatron isn't seen because he's frozen in some dam according to the timeline. Screw you, Megatron. And towards the end of the movie, Bumblebee turns into the classic Chevy Camaro, which is from the very first Transformers. But in the after credit scene, we see that he's talking to Optimus Prime and a bunch more Autobots are seen coming down from the sky. Mm -hmm. And this coupled with there being like no AllSpark and contradictions with the first contact, basically they announced that this was a reboot. This kind of sparks an interesting question. Can a reboot be considered a retcon? Because some reboots will still have continuity with the franchise. Ghostbusters 2016 tried to do both, you know, where yeah. it still takes place in the same universe, but then they had the actors playing different people. I don't go to Chinatown. I don't drive wackos. I ain't afraid of no ghosts. And again, it's kind of just hard to think about that when you're being a bouncing off the first movie, but also doing your own thing. Exactly. You got to find that perfect Mad Max balance. Yeah, 100%. And, it, and the thing that bothers me the most is like when a, a franchise retcons and then it's on the fence about what to do. It's it, To me, it's just yeah. like pick a side, you know, reboot or continue. Exactly. When, when you do see that, you really just think that the studio just wants the biggest demographic possible and that they're just casting the widest net, you know. But you can't make everybody happy. Yeah, take take a chance. Yeah. You know, it pays off to take a chance versus just having. I think it's worse to have a generic movie than a bomb these days. Oh yeah, just having a box office bomb is way better than having a movie that only made like thirty million dollars or something. Agreed. Having said that, I do have some thoughts. Really, uh, my friend here thinks it's fine the way it is. Listen, we're not saying we have all the answers here, but we have most of the answers. And we're going to run through some franchises that we think could be fixed with a retcon or two. First and foremost, we're fixing Indiana Jones. I'm just going to say, Indiana Jones doesn't need a son. He needs a student. The next <laughs> Indiana Jones film should ignore that Shia LaBeouf is supposed to be Indy's son. Having yeah. the next successor be related to blood lineage is like... I don't know. It's boring. It's outdated. Why not have Indiana Jones retire teaching at a school and something comes up that will bring Indy out of retirement and an overly eager student that stows away? I mean, I'm going into the Lost World territory with the stowaway, but I do think we could make it work nicely. You don't even have to ignore that he has a son. You can just say the aliens took him away, you know? That's true. That's true. All all great ideas. Oh, uh, didn't you have a did, did you have a <laughs> didn't you have a son, Indy? Uh, yeah, but he had to go back to his home planet, you know? Yeah, right? you know, he's he's long gone. A couple light years, at least. <laughs> I have to go now. My planet needs me. <laughs> they took Spielberg and Lucas with them, too, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start with X-Men. Okay. Fox's X-Men franchise. Uh, I, I'm going to say right now, I'm very happy Disney bought them out. Let me say I tried to learn the timeline, and I just didn't understand it. Yeah. The second time travel gets involved, I give up. Exactly. And it's I'm sure you all know that the X-Men franchise started off great. It's a bit of a mess now, yeah. and it's because they put in uh, time travel and stuff. So my first recommendation, totally retcon it, start from scratch, get rid of the time travel element, and just focus on making good individual movies. How is that a retcon and not a reboot, though? It's more of a reboot. I'm just saying, as a fan, I want that to happen <laughs> because it has so much you, potential. You just want more. You just want more X Men. Yeah, but like good X Men. Dark Phoenix was atrocious, and they were just making a movie for the sake of making a movie, making money, whatever. You know, make a good story. Here's a retcon for you. What yeah. if all of the X Men films that came out exist within the universe of this new rebooted X Men film as films starring the X Men, where famous actors. Uh played these people in the movie versions yeah that way you can reboot the entire or you can retcon the entire cast of the x-men to be whoever you wanted to be and yeah. be like man i can't believe you had you know so and so playing you as wolverine you know he's way buffer than you ever were <laughs> and just have them start off being already a thing and yeah, yeah. everyone would know who the x-men are they would have tons of movies about superheroes yeah. that's one of those things i never understood about the marvel movies they would have Avengers movies like yeah. they would have Avengers movies in that universe and I would love to see what those movies would look like look I'm a comic book I'm a serial did a Christmas album and uh, a so so popsicle you know what that's really interesting somebody should <laughs> I think you should work at Marvel somebody needs to listen to this and hire you I mean the most relevant example right now uh, would probably be the DCEU you know the DC 
cinematic universe, whatever you want to call it, because it's it's there is no singular vision there right now, and it's it's really hurt them. They they started by trying to replicate the Marvel Studios Marvel Cinematic Universe model, but backward. They wanted to fast track to introducing a team and then build off five years of spinoffs after that. Um, and their approach was to focus on the filmmakers rather than a single lead or single vision. But they botched it entirely on both fronts, right? They try to introduce a team but they and do it filmmaker friendly but they messed up the movie and hijacked each one right it started with bbs and then with justice league they pushed the director out and it became a big mess suicide squad they completely messed up and even this year with birds of prey they interfered with kathy yan the, the director's vision they're not at all filmmaker friendly given all these examples uh but with hbo max bringing back director zack snyder letting him redo justice league it's the best chance yet for them to kind of reset the whole whole franchise and to kind of realign with their original vision now if this works and this is an unprecedented situation it has never happened before in film right where it's the original director is coming back after being pushed off and is redoing the movie as a bigger movie or a miniseries and then that i guess would be the new continuity and if they if it works if it works they could do the proper sequel they'd always planned and get bring back all these actors and characters characters to do the movies as they originally intended to and it would give them finally a singular vision where you and i could talk and finally know what's happening with superman you know what i mean because nobody knows but for the original vision like because you know there are big futures to be had with wonder woman and aquaman and they're yeah. still trying to make the flash happen but if there's no justice league imagine the marvel cinematic universe where you didn't know who's playing captain america in the next movie and you didn't know if the avengers <laughs> would ever come back it wouldn't make any sense bouncing off that i think we can fix die hard yippee mr falcon yippee ki Mr. Falcon? There's no Mr. Falcon in the movie. After watching Die Hard with The Rock, I came away with the realization that John McClane, he just needs to be trapped in something. Yep. The problem with the films after the third were that John kept expanding just how big of a reach he had. He went from defending a building, to an airport, to a city, to a country, to the world. Yep. And I think he's best used in situations where he has time to stop and reflect and assess the situation and come up with a game plan. Yeah. Again, these movies used to be simple cop with no shoes, yes. MacGyvering his way, you know? And now he's basically a Marvel superhero that's taking down helicopters and sliding around. I think it would be a great idea to pick up after the events of the third film years later with a retired John McClane at his cottage. Have the surrounding cottage area be taken over by, I don't know, some some forces that come there and want some other thing. Right. And along the way, you discover that he's connected to the attacker somehow. Yeah. And retcon his sons. Stop trying to cram even more like male action hero sons in our faces. Yeah. All these male action heroes just always have sons that are ready to take on the role as their successors. It's just yeah. so lame. Well, you know what? They're future proofing the franchise because they. I think the idea is that they're going to take over from the main character. Yeah. But here, here's what I'm going to tell you right now. When it comes to Die Hard, here's the formula for a good Die Hard movie. Ready? It's Bruce Willis. Uh, terrorists. Yep. Uh, John McClane being trapped in something. Yep. Uh, John McClane not having shoes. Yep. Uh, and it's. Did I mention it's Christmas? <laughs> and six one one f bomb. We 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 need one. Just one. Yes. Quick one. Yes. One, quick one. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Die Hard. Moving on, we have a franchise that I don't think could possibly be fixed, but Resident Evil. And as much as the franchise needs to be restarted, and I'm pretty sure they are restarting it completely, I have this really soft spot in my heart for the very first Resident Evil movie. The later films were just horrible, like absolutely terrible. And the first film isn't great by any means either, but they just turned schlockier and schlockier as it went on. Eh. Basically trying to one-up their previous films. And again, it was in the middle of the 3D craze where they were trying to shove action movies down our throats with oh, yeah. 3D stuff flying all over us. Yeah, way back when, when 3D was cool, yeah. <laughs> the later films were horrible. It just led to a huge mess of the film franchise in terms of quality and story and I'd love to see Mila Jovovich come back for a true sequel to the ending of the very first movie and the end of the very first movie is she walks out of the science center into a destroyed raccoon city grabs a shotgun and it kind of pulls out to like a destroyed city and ends there that's where I want the movie to start right. I want a direct sequel ideally it would be a direct sequel but I say we have a retcon sequel of her as an aged Raccoon City dweller living and fighting whatever remaining zombies are there, you know? Have the time jump between the movies be realistic, you know? 20 years goes by and she's yeah. still in Raccoon City. Yeah. Because, again, when that thing was pulling out at the very end of that Resident Evil movie, I was so hyped to see what they could do in there. Yeah. And I think the the, the the next movie just retcons and she wakes up in, you know, another testing chamber and it was all a dream or it was all a test or something. Yeah, they yeah, constantly yeah. do that with those movies. Yes, exactly. 
This one is a bit of a stretch, but stay with me. We have Tom Cruise's The Mummy. Oh boy. <laughs> this was supposed to be the first film in the cinematic Universal Monster universe, which I'm pretty sure was also rebooted after they did it with like a failed Frankenstein movie that was supposed to be the true start. Did terribly, and I think yeah. they wanted Tom Cruise to do it. Uh, they were going to have uh, like a mummy planned. They were going to have all sorts of things, and it was just super lackluster. And clearly the film was meant to shoehorn in cameos and clues to other monsters to eventually build up to this expensive Monster Squad movie. And it never happened. And my idea of retconning the film universe is buy the rights to that Invisible Man film that just came out. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a perfect movie, but it was awesome. I thought it was fantastic. It, it was a modern retelling with mature themes and an excellent performance by Elizabeth Moss. And have this be the first of the franchise. And just take your time creating these new, fresh takes on horror classics. Like, I could you imagine if they spent 10 years, every two years they put out another movie like this? Like, yeah. maybe two years we get the thing from the Black Lagoon that was created by some poisoning in a company that they're trying to profit off of. You know, dumping. Yeah. I know they always dump stuff in lakes in movies, but I'm sure there's a new, fresh way that they could do it. Exactly. You know, have the Wolfman be a survival story with, like, Liam Neeson fighting wolves and he finds this guy that was raised by wolves, you know? Yeah. You don't have to put these overt references to other upcoming films. The audience can connect the dots, you know? Exactly. Have some faith in us. Exactly, exactly. And I think having a successful, like, good Monster Universe would be great. Mm -hmm. I like the idea. Just... Again, work on the approach. Yeah, I, I want my parents to have the same, you know, fun as the Marvel Cinematic Universe as we do with their, you know, monster movies. Oh, I right. remember the mummy. Oh, I remember the <laughs> invisible man, you know. <laughs> Back in the day. Oh, they're all they're all coming together now. <laughs> yeah. Canon, you know, is defined by the creatives, right? So yeah. so that of course the retcons can be redefined. Uh, but you know, us, the viewers, or the viewers, we are not the makers. So it, what we label something is irrelevant. And to say a filmmaker or any artist can't have new or evolving ideas would be insane uh, and counterproductive. Now, the George Lucas example, you know, his original ideas for Star Wars, like I said, every stormtrooper had a lightsaber. His ideas changed. We never saw that, thankfully. We did see yeah. concept art, but that didn't happen in the film. But, you know, it wasn't until feedback and his ideas changed that, you know, lightsaber became that iconic weapon. For me, it's only acceptable when a retcon is additive to a story and not changing a story in like a negative or unnecessary way. It has to result in net positive. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for doing this, man. This is awesome. Cheers. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Where can they find you, Rob? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Rob underscore Keys. That's K-E-Y-E-S. And uh, in the evenings, I'm usually on Twitch, uh, hanging out with fans on twitch.tv slash failcube. Anytime, man. Cheers. Perfect, man. Cheers. So we've gotten to the end of the episode without retconning ourselves out of existence. Thank you so much for joining us today again, Nick. Where can they find you online? Ah, thank you, Orion. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I can be found myself at Nick the Sound Grip online, and uh, my podcast, Did Somebody Say Movies? You can find us at DSSM underscore podcast. Awesome, yeah. I'll definitely be checking out your podcast, and we now have the Behind the Screen podcast up on Spotify, so you can take us on the go. Today we looked at some franchises that tried to give it another chance. Whether they retcon something to make this story easier to tell, or they just didn't want to be part of the franchise, retcons seem to happen for almost random reasons. The good news is that sometimes they really nail it. Sometimes a retcon can breathe so much life into an old franchise, while also igniting a resurgence for the original. But sometimes they can also make the original film harder to watch. So let's aim for more repros and less retcons. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast. Leave a like and a comment letting us know what retcon you're most interested in. I just can't stop thinking about Buster Rhymes kicking Michael Myers out that window. 